chance to read it that's perfectly acceptable to we can make a motion to table it till the next regular meeting just so that we don't have to read it right now okay, okay? just give you the heads up All right is there any public comment system and so new hires now so you may have heard the, the sort of pension fund for for teachers in the state is having some troubles uh, a mechanism that was put in place a couple of years ago to help uh, overcome some of those troubles was for every new hire in the district there's this um, I believe a one-time fee that the district pays to the state on behalf of that new hire that goes into this pension fund to try and help kind of close the gap. And then in addition to that, every educator pays into the state teacher's retirement system their 5% of their salary. So that would be just a normal annual pay-in So for, for the new hires, there's that one time, I think it's one time, Floyd, are you? No. I think it's I a think one time, I don't think it's an annual. Not. The, the one that the part that's annual is for grant employees. Right. That's part of the same idea. Yep. But the list is like, I didn't count, but there's a lot of people there that in that code. I had to look at that. Um, yeah, and I couldn't even recall off the top of my head how many new hires we would have had last year or even or coming into this year. And you said annually there's a 5%, can you, can you say that again? Right, so, so each educator pays into the state teacher's retirement system, I believe it's 5% of their salary, um, and that over time is part of what helps fund the pension system as well. But I think what they found is that it's been insufficient um, given the need, so they're trying to create ways to put more money into the pension system to make it a little more viable. So looking deep, briefly at the detail, there's like over 50 individuals listed out. It's got to be new and grant funded both. New and grant yeah. funded in the same yes. one. The, the, those acronyms are, you're right, the teacher's retirement acronyms. I can't remember what OPEB stands for, but it's exclusive of both new hires yeah. and grant funded employees. So when you think about um, people who are paid in time of money, like I've got a whole bunch, and then also folks who are in um, subscription, <coughs> there are grant funded employees. I'm partially grant funded, so part of my salary has to go to the So there's pieces and parts of a lot of people. So the, the 50 plus makes sense. So. It doesn't make sense to me yeah, if it's not just new hires. If we're talking about grant funding, it must be. Right. And, it, and it, it's not 50 FTE. Exactly. Right. Prorated for those so, partial. So somebody yeah. who might be. <coughs> 5% funded by a grant is going, going to show, it's going to show up. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <coughs> when I, I was ch 
checking on, where did the page go? Where you have the little words. Um, the tuition, an additional student at RES, yes, so does that mean a student is paying to go into Robinson? Does that mean? If I could know where you're looking. Well, it says 13, 12, one additional. Oh, you're on the, the, the summary, summary, summary page. page. That. Top of the summary page. We had we had one additional student come in this year, and so that that's why we're over budget. We're also projecting that student to be with us again next year. And that's showing as a revenue it must be then. So, right. so and it's any student, or is that a paying student? It's a paying student. Oh, okay. Right. So so students that are not that don't live within the five towns that attend our elementary schools in particular. Um, would be paying a tuition unless there's some sort of a waiver to attend. So that's a usually set at a rate. So it's you know probably somewhere in the sixteen seventeen thousand range um, no, for tuition. So sixteen zero one five. Sixteen zero one five. And that could also include so for example students living in Buell's Gore. Oh, yeah. Outside of our five towns, they have some choice as to what elementary school they go to because they don't operate elementary school in Beale Score. Okay. Um, so those students that, if, if a student from Beale Score were to attend Robinson, the sort of taxpayers of Beale Score pay for the tuition for that student to come to Robinson. Gotcha. So it's like for that reason. Any other questions? <laughs> Okay, moving down to the update <coughs> the strategic plan, and there was a message you included in your um, packet from Spot. It sounded a little bit like one of those updates we might get from the marketing council. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if there might be a little, any more detail than what was provided there, other than that things look good. <clears throat> yeah, there's certainly additional detail. I was uh, Krista was not at the last no. one, but Katrina was, so we can we can piggyback. But um, really, the the work continued to understand more. So the the strategic plan oversight team is really focused on. Oh, actually, Liz, you're there, right? And I think you were there the other night, so you can certainly join in as well. The the sort of objective for the oversight team is to advise me as superintendent in terms of future direction for the work in the strategic plan and sort of a, a barometer for our capacity as an organization to engage in that work. And so in order to do that well, it's important for that oversight team to understand more deeply what does it take to actually implement one of these objectives. So we dug a little deeper into sort of the timeline of work that's happening around our objectives that are our current focus. Um, and also digging deeper into what the actual work has been and, and sort of the efforts it takes to make that happen. So that was probably better than half of the meeting that we had. And the other half was digging into the strategic plan with that critical eye of what would it take to implement the other these other objectives. Um, so that combination of knowing what it takes to implement an objective and knowing the objectives that are the other objectives in the strategic plan that are not our current focus um, has been the process so far leading up to that committee being able to advise me about how we go from here. And what was the advice, or do you expect the advice to be forthcoming? Forthcoming. Okay. Probably April. <clears throat> okay. I think that's what was sort of missing. Yeah. So four. So we have four meetings, and the the first one was two hours, and we decided that wasn't enough, and we have uh, we've added an hour to each of the next uh, meetings to try and give us some more time. And the fourth meeting is when. Uh, when I'm looking for the advice to come. And that was pretty strategic being April. That gives us some time in the spring to be thinking about where are we going with this and making preparations for any summer work that would need to happen and gearing up for the fall when everyone returns to sort of launch into whatever the new area might be. Right. Okay. I didn't go to the meeting, but I saw some of the links and I just was struck and I think I remarked on this to you, Patrick, that there was so much um, great sharing of what's happening currently and I just um, found myself wondering how we could share that out more broadly mm -hmm. um, 
and especially with the board getting a better idea of how this is rolling out and um, so that might be something that is <coughs> comes out of April. Yeah. Yeah. So what links were you looking at, Krista? In our in the agenda for this committee. Okay. Um, there were a lot of links to um, initiatives and just really it was really robust information about kind of the behind the scenes work that I hadn't seen before. So. And the agenda for that committee is sent to to that committee specifically. Right. So it's not a board committee. So right. right. So you're on that. Right. Yeah, and Liz also. Right. Okay. Would it be on the website? Yep. No. Okay, I would think, like these two, the timelines that you had out for the um, EIL and the SEO, like those I found really helpful and maybe other people would. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I, there's I, might, I might offer sure. that we've invited the co-facilitators of both of the sport teams, and I know Spoit and team is redundant, but I can't fit. Um, to come to our February spot meeting, and part of that will be um, uh, a bit of an FAQ, like to go just a little bit deeper into the links that you're referring to are some of their their work plans currently this year, but also what they envision to be the work of the upcoming years, and also um, communications. So it has been a big conversation, <coughs> with not not as much the whole Spoit team, but certainly the co-facilitators about. How do we and when do we communicate the work that we're doing? We are early still, early, yeah. early, early. We are developing, we are designing, we are collaborating, and we really only had, I don't know, the equivalent of eight days, maybe seven days, if you don't count last June and some of the work to come up to this year. So it's, we don't want to be too premature. We don't want to over-promise deadlines and that sort of thing. But part of that February connection with the co-facilitators will be to help gauge that. It's not necessarily the spots job to figure out the communication plan, but some input like what you're doing right now through the spot will be really helpful because they, they are representative of not just the board but students and teachers and folks from all across the district. So hearings, teasing that out with them and then bringing a recommendation to the admin team is what we're talking about just today, this morning. Yeah, because that's like, that's the most exciting stuff for us to hear about <laughs> and the thing we don't hear as much about as we might like to so yeah, yeah. and the the challenge for me and, and this is I think we only get there through continued conversation is the level of detail so we as a as a spot have spent five hours now together understanding to the level that we understand now the work that's been happening um, so obviously that would be a commitment of time if the board was interested in understanding to the same depth so and if not that same depth then what depth Right. And how do we gauge that? Um, so I think keeping the conversation open to try to figure that out is great. All right. Okay, we'll move down to board management and governance. To, um, and we'll start um, with an action item to accept the monitoring report for 3.2 accountability of the superintendent. And that was in your packet. So in order to talk about it, we'll leave a motion for it. So moved. Sarah McLean. I second. Andrew seconds. Okay. All right. Any questions? Any comments? Let me get my phone on. <laughs> any questions okay so just a thumbs up um, based on the information provided do you find does the board find that the in, the board's interpretation is reasonable okay. um, does the board find that the data demonstrates the accomplishment of those interpretations okay all right all those in favor of accepting 3.2 accountability of the superintendent please say aye aye, aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? <clears throat> okay. All right. Now you have the option of um, an act. You have the option of two, of one action, <laughs> either to move to accept the monitoring report for 4.3, and I passed it out, 
or to move to table it to the next regular meeting when you have, have had time to look at it, and then we can talk about it at the next meeting. So those are your options. You have to do one before you can talk about it, either way. I'll move to table it. All right, so Kevin will... Is there a second to table it? Please. Right. Any discussion? Just at the next regular meeting, our next regular scheduled meeting is fine. Okay. All right, all those in favor of, a, of tabling 4.3 agenda planning till the next regular meeting, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? I'll give you all time to read it. <coughs> Okay. Next item is an action item to Sorry, set Sorry, Don. Yes. Um, just as that, I'm assuming that's going out in an email or something to people who aren't here today. Yeah, it will be on the agenda, oh, okay. at the next agenda, so the link will be there yeah, yeah. on the next agenda. So, okay. Um, next action item is to set school choice limits at 10 new seats in and 10 new seats out. So is there a motion? What is it currently? It's... Ten new seats in, ten new seats out. So I can describe more. Yeah. Yeah, we just need a motion to. So. Um, <coughs> all right, to Krista. Second. And Steve. All right. Go ahead. You have a question? Yeah, I'm. I'm also curious. To, uh, what are the requests that come in as well? So. I can just sort of give a brief overview, which I think addresses a couple of those questions and might anticipate some other questions that might be out there. <clears throat> so the ten in and ten out are the fewest that we. Uh, we can offer that are required by law. So there's statute around school choice uh, at the high school level. So this is 10, this means we, we can allow 10 students to choice out of Mount Abe for new seats. So effectively how this would work out is we, always, we pretty much always have a wait list for the students that are looking to choice out of MUSD, out of Mount Abe High School specifically. Um, and so as a result, this would mean a total of 40 students choosing out of Mount Abe. So 10 new each year. Theoretically, each freshman class has 10 students choosing to sort of option their, their choice out. Um, so if that's 10 each year, that's 40 over the course of the 9 through 12. So it can be a pretty big number. And it's the fewest we can, we can allow by statute. Similarly, the 10, uh, the 10 students that can come in um, that I think is also the fewest that we have to allow by statute. Um, we have not had, at least to my knowledge, ever a waiting list for kids that want a choice in. So the, we do usually have a few, you know, one, two, three, um, some, some relatively small number. Um, so there is definitely a, a, a net exit um, of students from that age. How does that affect the Number it doesn't affect the pupil number at all because there, there's no sort of monetary exchange between schools through the school choice um, statute, which is why there's some latitude to set limits in terms of how many kids can go out or come in. And is it just simply first ask, first serve? Yep. There's no, no, not first, sorry, not first ask, first serve. It's a lottery. So there's a <coughs> deadline by which people who are interested in choicing out need to get their paperwork in. And then there's a sort of random selection of students from that lottery, and uh, others are waitlisted, and the, even the waitlist is by lottery. So if there are five kids on the waitlist, um, those are sort of ordered by their their sort of draft from the lottery. And if one of the first ten is offered their choice out, and they choose not to accept, then we go to the the top of that that um, sort of waitlist. And does that family then take responsibility for the tuition to wherever they're going? Nope. So the tuition, there's no tuition that follows. So there's no, there's no exchange. The family is responsible for transportation. So if you choose to go to wherever high school, we're not responsible for getting you there okay. or back. Um, but there's no tuition that exchanges. So, so for the students that we receive, we don't get any funds for them. And the students who leave us, we don't lose any funds because they're leaving us. So if we had 10 students going out, we get to count them as our 10 students, um, and we had no coming in, then, then we do. So it's a, you could argue there's a, a 
somewhat of a benefit, I guess, because we get to count them, but we don't have to educate them. <laughs> you want to think of it that way. And when, when people switch to a sale, is that for one year and then they have to reapply, or do they, that's... You're, if, you, if you're awarded your choice out as a freshman, that's yours until you choose to no longer use it. Okay. So that gets you through your high school career. Just because of the recognition of... That would be really you know, you cumbersome. Get, exactly. Yeah. Cumbersome and really not in the best interest of students. So as they, as they establish their roots in their new high school, to then potentially have that sort of pulled from them before they graduate, yeah. this wouldn't really work very well. So the program sounds to me like it's high school and the jump in point is freshman or Correct. could it be specifically high school nothing earlier than freshman and only freshman or could you it, it could be anything it? beyond so if we didn't have so if there were I guess an example if we had a, a freshman class one year that had more than 10 people that wanted to choice out and we had people on a wait list the next year rolls around and and um, those people that didn't get the option last year are highest on that on that list. So they're still that wait list becomes sort of the next the <coughs> first group of the next ten, oh. and then new lottery people are added. Um, so as a sophomore, if you didn't get in as a freshman, you could you'd have sort of first dibs at tracing out as a sophomore. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, because you had your freshman year in high school, et cetera, and you want to just keep going. Um, so if you deny that, then it goes down to the next group. So chances are, um, if you didn't get in as a freshman and you still wanted in as a sophomore, you would likely get that option as a sophomore, is my understanding of how that lottery process works. So you'd end up with 40 students, that's what, 5% of the top student population-ish? 40 students in the high school is closer to 10%. 10%. Because it's just 912. So 912 right now, we're 430 students, something like okay. that, 450 students. So 40 you know, 8% maybe. Hannah or Bella, did you want to say, do you have any thoughts, anything you want to add? Mm -hmm. I don't want to skip by you if you want to, mm -hmm. if you want to say something. Okay. Liz. So for me, it feels like an opportunity, or at least uh, for a student voice in particular, because we're saying as inconvenient as it may be for us to figure out um, what it will mean for us and what it will look like for us, but saying if they have a need that they feel they can be better served somewhere else, it's just saying, okay, we uh, letting them do that. So it feels important to me. There are many different reasons why students want to choice out. Mm -hmm. It's hard to necessarily put a, a finger on why. Why? It's a lot of different whys. And they're not required to say why. Nope. <clears throat> Do you propose to add to the I would. Yeah. Yeah. What number? I, it's, uh, <clears throat> so for me I wouldn't um, I'm a I'm a fan of it altogether and I guess maybe that's for another conversation we're talking about. Um, what came up at the November 20th meeting and the different options that we talked about with our community for like nine through 12 school choice all together. I mean, so, so to me, um, I, I wouldn't put any limit on it. So I don't know mm -hmm. if maybe there is, somebody has some ideas about a middle ground. I think it becomes an equity so. issue because it's easier for some families to transport to another school. So you have to watch out that, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's an equity issue, too. And I think, I've, I mean, when I've thought about it, and um, you know, if somebody is on free and reduced lunch, there could be a $5 a day stipend for gas. There is carpooling, because they wouldn't be using the bus systems. Um, schools can put out lists and say, these are all the students from your area that are coming to us, and they can figure that out together. I've heard at all the community meetings, people talking about how they all can lean on each other and look out for each other. Like I just, I, I heard really clearly the other day that those who, um, and I thought you put it well, that have the means will get there and those without will not. And so I think that there's some, 
problem solving and thinking to do. There is a Tri-Town area bus that runs through the area, goes Bristol, Bridgeton, and Middlebury. Um, and I, I think, I, I just feel like there's more opportunity there for equity than we're necessarily, would immediately be present, but there's some problem solving that could be done. I think as we think about this, this particular situation in terms of the school choice, as is defined by statute currently, mm -hmm. the if we played out the idea of unlimited seats for this, there are limited seats in the schools they would be going to. Um, the the number the, the top two schools that our students tend to choice out to are CVU and Middlebury, um, and they limit how many they they have coming in, okay. and they almost always fill all of their seats. So even if we did set an unlimited amount, it doesn't mean that they would get into the school that they might want to go to. Um, just, just to factor that in. Mm -hmm. Chris, do you know what their limits are? They said there's annually as well. Um, I don't know for sure. Uh, I want to say, I want to say it's closer to 20 for CVU, but I don't know for sure. That's just sort of trying to draw from memory, which sort of makes sense when you think about their size relative to our size because it's based on the size of your school. Mm -hmm. um, and Middlebury, it's what? 1,350 students. <clears throat> and that's 912. Compared to our 450-ish, yeah, nine twelve, yeah. yeah. So that's it's three times the size. No, that's, that's CBU. CBU. Yeah. Okay. CBU is thirteen fifty. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and so Middlebury I, I, might be ten. It's between ten and fifteen. I don't think it's beyond fifteen. Do you know? What? How many requests do we get? Like, like this year, how many requests do we have from freshmen? Uh, the deadline's not up yet, so this this um, is a piece that sort of moves that that process along. But we, I would say, we are usually around fifteen. Okay. Like I feel like if it was set at fifteen, we would be allowing all or nearly all of the requests the opportunity to choice it out, whether or not they get in elsewhere. Of course, still mm -hmm. even even now sometimes. The, with our 10, not all of our students get to go. And, and they identify their first choice school, second choice school, maybe third choice school. <clears throat> so uh, if, for example, we, we allowed all 15, what are the chances that they wouldn't get into those other? I guess I'm just wondering. It's also a lottery, so it's really hard to know. Oh, right. So I'm, I'm wondering if it would sort itself out if we. Yeah, I think it's important to. And, and nuanced, so difficult to have a long conversation about, but also important to acknowledge the impact 40 to 60, if we increase it to 15 mm -hmm. students, fewer um, in our high school would have in terms of class size, rosters, what does that mean? Like, can we, I, I don't know what the, it's hard to know if, are there patterns in terms of the type of student that is choicing out and what classes would they take had they stayed with us and what impact would that have on enrollment in AP classes, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I mean, as it is right now, we have, uh, we have classes of <coughs> seven students or nine students that, um, that we know are costly and we still offer because we want to maintain a breadth of programming. So, and there's a, there's a value in having more students in those classes, not only from an economic perspective, but also from a, from a depth of conversation, student interaction, student discourse perspective. So um, there, are, there are consequences that way as well. Elizabeth? I think I already answered it in my own head, but like in theory, the theoretical <coughs> 20 students at CBU could take, that's not just Mount Nave students, I mean, that could be like South Hero or Burlington or, you know, so. Any number of schools, yep. Yeah. I do think it's interesting how it, how your your point addresses the larger conversations that are happening. So I, I appreciate that perspective, and I think all we actually can ha affect our our numbers. So we could put out there what how where we're going to limit our numbers, and then whether or not people get into their desired schools, that's out of our hands. Mm -hmm. And important to acknowledge too that uh, a significant difference between school choice where no money exchanges hands mm -hmm. and school choice where right. $20,000 per mm -hmm. student changes hands. Right. Right. Schools will be much more willing to open the doors 
when there's a twenty thousand dollar check that comes with each kid that comes through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any more questions? Need any more information? To understand it. Okay. All those in favor of setting the school choice limits at ten seats in and ten seats out, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Next is an action item to discuss and accept the proposal for additional services provided by Susan McCormick and Creative Discourse. That packet was passed around. Okay, so to make it official, we need a. Um, so move. Okay. Second. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Um, <laughs> is there a second? Second. All right. Now we can talk about it. Okay. Um, I'm going to read this to you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I think it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I second it. <laughs> We talked about it a little bit last time, and you know it's an investment that I think we, we need to continue making. Kevin, I, I agree. Um, I, I was very impressed with the um, balance that she has brought to the conversations today, and I don't think we would be nearly as successful through that process without her. And I think it's important to continue it. Till we get to the point where you know we've, we're gelling and, and uh, can grow up and be on our own. Sarah, I thoroughly support this. Um, I think it's really helpful to have somebody kind of lead the way and organize it. Um, I would. I'm a little worried about this January date, so that's my only hang up is for the. The date, I think, is really important that we're all there, and I know that doesn't have anything to do with this, but there was only four days offered, and I, got, I panicked a little bit about that. So I don't know if that was because of her and when she could do it and stuff like that, but I, just kind of I think it was for that retreat day that were for those four days, but yeah. some of it was Sue's schedule. She's booking, so. Mm -hmm. That's basically when Sue and all of the administrators are available. Okay. That's what I made it to four. I support this 100%, but is there any other kind of consultation we need in regard to the process we're doing? Not the process we're doing, but um, is there anyone that helps school districts? Is it, it they make that be through the VSBA? Um, and, and maybe this is part of the next step, because depending on the scenarios that we pick to, to, but even before we pick the scenarios, is there any kind of a consultant it just helps with part of the process that we're at. Um, we've got options and possibilities, but um, some of us who, who's sort of ushered some other districts through this process, either you know in Vermont or I, I don't know. It's just that having been at meetings and it feels like we have a lot of information <coughs> and we're analyzing it and we still don't have a direction. And that's not something that like Sue would do. She's doing a different piece of it. Mm -hmm. So is there any through the VSBA or, I mean, I can look on the website, but later. I don't, I don't know about the VSBA, but um, I think I know what you're saying, which is many of the things we've been talking about still leave us with more questions. And the, the, maybe the question is, how do we get the answers? And um, I've been wondering the same thing, is that it, is that just architectural studies? I don't know. And so um, it might be looking at what other districts that are farther along have done to gather that information. And I don't know, maybe you know, Patrick, if um, our neighboring, you know, Harwood has gone through a lot of intensive studies, as has the, the um, Addison Central. So I don't know how they've figured out what parts and pieces and who's helped them with that. But is that kind of what you're some of yeah, because other at. people are doing this, and it feels right. like we and have no friendly. roadmap whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Like we, what we have is great; it's awesome, <laughs> but we have no roadmap going forward. Yeah, and I also don't know if we <laughs> get at Bless some you. of that 
because that might be part of what we talk about at the end when we have our retreat. Yeah, I'm not sure I fully understand the kind of support that you're talking about. When I'm thinking about it may be an architectural firm that we contract with to help with the study of the scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> but in reality, the support we're, we're, we would be paying for is a feasibility study. So mm -hmm. if we're talking about a scenario that involves, for example, Choice High School. So that part of that feasibility study is <laughs> I imagine it. And I feel like this is the kind of support we would get from an architectural firm. And there'd be a partnership, right, in terms of exploring that. But <coughs> So if we think about school choice at the high school level, that could look like um, a direct partnership or sort of merger with Addison Northwest. That could look like some sort of a, an Addison County agreement with Addison Northwest, Sobergens, and Middlebury. Or it could look like wide open choice, pick a school, and we send a check to that school for the tuition. Those three versions of not operating a high school would be studied through this process that informs next step. So I don't know if that's the kind of support you're thinking of, that idea of a feasibility well, study, or if it's more the process. But that's certainly, but there's 10 ideas out there. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe we'll, we'll figure it out at the retreat. I mean, I know that for that, there's the Islands mm -hmm. District, which tuitions everyone out, right? right? So, mm -hmm. um, which I'm not in favor of, by the way, because I think we lose all control over education for 800 students, pretty much, or, 700 students or how many people so anyway I just want to put that in but yeah I mean it just feels like it's a new process and so you're thinking more more support in l making decisions about which scenarios to study yes not so much support following the scenarios yes. to study and I don't know if that exists it may not and we just have to wing it so that happens too so well I also think uh you know, architecture firms are a little bit limited in what they understand. Coming from one, they. If they have a if they have a problem that somebody wants solved, it's fairly n narrowly focused. They can bricks and mortar and dollar and cents that and sorry system to analyze that pretty well. But when you're looking at uh, a whole educational regimen and how the interaction of the systems all work, and whether they work better in this combination or that combination, I don't know if that's necessarily an architectural forte. That may be somebody who's a precursor to an architectural study where it's more bricks and mortar. Um, I mean, there may be architectural firms who specialize in this, because there's architectural firms that specialize in all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So. But I, I understand exactly where you're coming from. You know, we have a lot of different concepts out there. That, and just settling down on the ones we want to ask somebody to, to be bricks and mortar about is, uh, is a tall task. Right. Yeah, just thinking about our timeline, I don't, I guess we'll have a board meeting before our retreat in January. No. Okay. No board meeting would follow. Right. So if and um, and I <coughs> haven't yet said that the community engagement committee will meet before then either. But there are some of these lingering questions about what kinds of information are we going to want, and I don't know if we'll. I think some of our retreat time will have to be hashing out, hashing some of that out, and maybe there's a way to get. Um, feedback from the board as the agenda continues to get built so so that even if Sue and Patrick and Don and I are talking about how, how to keep building the agenda which we have a general idea of we can be sure to be including since we won't have a board meeting what this group wants to make sure we're, we're talking about it's really hard because everything's happening <laughs> so fast and it's hard to figure out the time to get us all together, but yet we need to make sure we all are getting what we need out of the process, so, yeah. And right now we're also doing a principal search for Mount Aid, so if that's a very loud possibility, you know, if people hear that possibility, are they gonna? 
Oh, that choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wanna Thanks, Sam. Dive right in. I think that's. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think all the scenarios have have ripple effects. Mm -hmm. Well, the matter at hand is whether we're going to approve right, this. Right. Need to talk about it anymore? Okay. <coughs> so um, we we've done the discussion part. <laughs> so the action was to discuss and accept the proposal for additional services by Sue and Creative Discourse. <coughs> All those in favor of accepting the proposal, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Extensions. Sounds like a thunderstorm. It does. <laughs> 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 it's a rolling part, isn't it? Right? <laughs> <laughs> I keep thinking like thunder snow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The next item is to appoint an additional <laughs> member to the bargaining council. <laughs> Here we are, <laughs> begging <laughs> once in. <laughs> I mean, the action could be no action. <laughs> action. But there are four of us, and so there are two working with support staff and two working with professional staff, and we could use one more. Who's not here? What's that? Who's not here? That's how we do it. That's how it works around here. Just don't show up. You don't show up all of a sudden. All right. Sounds like there's no action. We're just going to... We don't need to listen to crickets. Next item is a discussion around the budget. Let's use our time to talk about that, I guess. Okay. So a couple of things, and I thought maybe we'll first go through the presentation. I'll share some updated oh. numbers. And and then I have an updated version. Um, folks in a bunch of work to try and, and do some updates to the format of the document that you saw last time we were together. So it's another draft. <coughs> we'll sort of take a look at that, take any more comments, and bring another revised draft next time. So we'll, we'll, we can do that after. So, fun times. We have equalized pupil, so that's good. We got that over the weekend. So Friday night, we got the first draft equalized pupil. Monday midday, we got draft number two of equalized pupil. Oh my gosh. Um, it's entirely likely we may get maybe eight more drafts. Ten last year. We had ten last year, so. Uh, we're on our way. When Chances are it doesn't, it won't, I don't suspect it will change dramatically for us. Like for example, Friday night, uh, the difference from Friday night to Monday was a, a 1.5-ish um, equalized people. So some fine tuning uh, along the way. Among the last 10 drafts you got last year, what was the delta, remember? I would say among, eight, if I think about, of eight of the last 10 last year, uh, the delta was probably less than one. Uh, <laughs> <that's pretty laughs> so when they put a draft, like if there's a change anywhere, they put out a new draft of equalized people for everyone. Um, so even some of the versions, there was no change to our data <coughs> from version 7 to version 8. Oh, so that's what leads wide. to a delta that doesn't lead to, to much. Now that's not to say that there couldn't be some like big time oops at the state level that does send us a figure that's a significant change. I would never rule that out. Just past practice has been relatively minor changes. I know neighboring districts are seeing very surprising numbers, not to the good. Ours was was somewhat of a pleasant surprise. Um, others very much not a pleasant surprise. Like. 50 to 60 or more fewer equalized people. Mm. Big, big, big impact. So we're fortunate not to be in that situation. So some of this will look familiar, and I'll kind of go through it quickly, and, and then we'll spend time on where we're seeing changes and, and talk about some of the impact, although the impact's still at pretty high level because this is still really new information. So same challenge, improving outcomes for students at a cost deemed acceptable by the community and really making the linkage between community values and strategic plan goals, and being sure that those tie into the work that, uh, or the spending that you see in the budget. This is the, the target that was set, uh, to use the conservative equalized pupil numbers, which now we have better numbers to work with, and, and you'll see some information working with those numbers. But really the goal being, don't exceed that spending threshold. 
So I wanted to kind of bring us back to what did you hear in October, what did you hear in November, and what are we here uh, talking about tonight? And we'll dig a lot deeper into the December numbers. Um, but if you look on that far left column, those are the figures that we had in October. And perhaps what stands out most of all those figures is, ah, my, my pointer doesn't show up on the Prometheus blower. We were projecting, using those conservative estimates of equalized pupil, that we would be over our spending threshold by $711,000. I think we use 710 as a rounder number, <coughs> rounder number in some of the presentations. <coughs> when in November we heard um, there was a, a change in the threshold, so you can see in red it shows what was different from what you heard the month prior. So the only change in November's information was we got some good news that the estimate from the state on the, on the spending threshold went up by $24 a student. So that took our $711,000 and decreased it down to that six seventy six, which I think we called six seventy seven again, rounding for a little easier numbers. There was also talk in, in the meantime of, oh, and there's this other special ed reimbursement we're not going to get, and we have to account for that. Oh, but wait a minute, now we don't have to account for that. So that sort of was an in and out wash uh, in terms of that, that over under. So now we fast forward to December, and we'll talk a little bit about what's different here. So you can see the projected spending decreases by over a million dollars. This assumes a few things, and we'll get into these a little bit more, but most important for this conversation right now is this assumes that we take advantage of most of the attrition that we anticipate being generated by the career change that was offered. The others didn't, didn't assume any changes um, along those lines. Now we're starting to say, all right, so if we can take advantage of not all of the attrition, because I don't anticipate that we would be able to not fill all of the positions that we're seeing come through, but if we can take advantage of most of that attrition, this is the kind of savings that we're looking at. Um, and when we couple those projected savings by taking advantage of attrition, with an increase of over 24, almost 24 equalized pupil over what we were using for our estimate, that has a, a pretty positive effect, which you can see now has us projected at being under that spending threshold by $455,000. So that's great news. <laughs> but let's not I quite know. dance. <laughs> I'll let you have your moment, but I'm going to kind of yeah, yeah. bring it out of the Give us a little bit longer, Cashmere. All right. <laughs> This is my happy place too. Okay. I, I'm Let's stay right here. <laughs> <laughs> so, the next slide's not a bad slide. So we're still in our happy place. But I, I do want to talk about some of the assumptions that are behind this. So, as I said, that does assume that we take it, and this is specifically those December figures. This assumes we take advantage of the attrition that I talked about that's generated by the career change, which I want to remind everyone we spent money to generate that attrition. So if we don't take advantage of it, we've spent money that was for naught. Kevin? Um, is this appropriate time and place to talk about what the change in landscape will be um, with the reductions that the attrition is looking at as far as gaps and where it looks like people are um, taking it and what might be backfilled and what's left and you know, programmatically right. what, what the challenges are going to be. Almost, I guess, is my answer to that. So we can talk high level. So what I can say is right now, the figures that you're seeing, which again, don't assume we can take advantage of all of the attrition, but does assume we can take advantage of most of the attrition, 70% or so based of what we know now, um, has little to no programmatic effect on students. There's a, there is a program that's really, really um, underutilized that I think warrants further conversation about sustainability, uh, and that's sort of outside of this conversation. Um, so there's, there's more work to be done, um, and we need to look at equity across schools, et cetera, so not all decisions are, are included here that I think may need to be made. They're in process, now we have equalized people, we know what we need to do, and we know what we're working with, so we're gonna be able to, next time you see this draft, talk in a lot more depth about what those implications would be. Overall, little to no programmatic impact here. <laughs> and frankly, we're still trying to figure out, A, we don't know all of the folks that are going to submit for career change. 
And even right now, with those that we do know, we're trying to have conversations about what, what do we need to fill, what do we not need to fill, and looking at all those with a critical eye. And frankly, even after the budget is adopted and it's put to bed, and even after it's voted in, we will likely have some attrition, not from the career change, but from other circumstances, life circumstances, whatever. And every time we have some of those, we have to have a conversation about do we need to fill this position or not. So the more we can take advantage of attrition, now, later, whenever, the better positioned we are in the future to hit our budget targets and not have to riff people, <coughs> which is really the painful stuff. Which gets to the second bullet point here. We had a, a fair number of positions since the last, since this current budget was adopted last year, where people left for various reasons that we chose not to fill. So in addition to taking advantage of the career change that, that was offered, we took advantage of attrition in other ways in the months that preceded this conversation that we're having tonight. And those are part of the benefits you see in that reduction of expenses by a million dollars. So this also assumes equalized people will not change. It very well may. This assumes that we apply the entire prior year fund balance. There's some, there's some conversation we're going to have. We have a couple of slides that show you a couple of different scenarios about what happens depending on how we apply that fund balance. So we'll talk more about that. Um, this assumes the spending threshold doesn't change. Even though we got that projection from the state, it's still a projection at this point. We feel pretty good about using that number, but that is an assumption that's, that's behind here. And this does reflect the plus or minus $200,000 impact of the state level, state negotiations on health care. So, so the settlement that came out uh, fairly recently, um, which was in favor of the union's position on health care, um, we're figuring is about $200,000 more we need to budget than what we were already anticipating. Mm -hmm. So if you recall, we were already anticipating an increase of about 400000 We now need to budget about 200000 And we can talk a little bit about that. So part of the... 200000 more. 200000 more. Right. So 50% um, more than what we were thinking. Right. And here's what's sort of tricky about... There's a lot that's tricky about healthcare. What's particularly tricky right now that's relative to budget building is our current health care, the district pays last dollars, right? Employee pays first dollars, district pays last dollars. Because of that, we tend to see in the first half of, of, a, of a calendar year, which is a health care year, right? We see less district monies being spent in the first half of a calendar year, more district monies happening in the second half of a calendar year. Um, for us, the second half of a calendar year is the first half of a fiscal year. The new health care negotiations landed on a health care that is first dollars for a district. Mm -hmm. So we have a scenario where in the first half of a fiscal year for us, Double. we have the exposure of our, our higher end district dollars going out to cover our current health care. And in the second half of the same fiscal year, we have the first dollars for the new health insurance year. So our, we have that sort of double whammy. Um, you can think of it as a 200% exposure, right? <laughs> so, and with the way we tend to budget for healthcare costs, is we look at what's our total possible exposure? Like if everybody maxed out their healthcare benefit, what are the dollars that would cost us? And then what is the recommended percent of that total exposure that we ought to budget for uh, to be sure that we can cover what we might anticipate are the actual costs. So that's that double whammy. We have to budget for a high percentage of, in the same fiscal year, the high percentage of one year's um, health insurance and a high percentage of the following year's health insurance. So it's less than a 200% potential exposure for the next year. The following year, it's more real that it's a potential 200% exposure. Um, so that becomes a pretty significant cost. So this $200,000 impact this year is probably a more than $200,000 impact from a budgeting perspective, not necessarily an expense perspective, um, in the following budget year. Is that? I'm accepting your silence as understanding. <laughs> Let me know if it's something else. That's because you just pulled the, <laughs> took the floor right <laughs> out of our happy place. Yeah. <laughs> However, let's come back to this. What you saw reflects this 200000 So we're still on a happy page. This is still good. There's a cost there. 
It would have been happier. It could have been happier, but... <laughs> uh, so those are the, there are the assumptions behind those December figures, and we're going to get into some more of those in a minute, but if there are questions here, we can, we can pause for any of those. Has programming been affected by any of this? Of the people that left and that weren't? No, so as we're so we're trying to kind of get dialed in again in, in terms of where can we absorb the, the folks that are choosing to leave and not not fill those positions and where can we not? So we're having those program conversations right now. Um, there's little to no impact projected programmatically, and we're still trying to figure it out still. Thanks. Yeah. Can you just remind us when we will have more clarity around that? So there are, you might have seen an email from Jennifer today about trying to find what I thought was the desire from this board is to have another community conversation about the budget and we have a little bit more of the detail and for that to happen prior to your January meeting where you have to actually adopt the budget. So we were looking at, I think there's actually one date. January 22nd. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just looking at availability and things like that. So perhaps January 22nd, um, not perhaps, assuming January 22nd happens, whenever that meeting happens, we can dig deeper into those programmatic um, uh, impacts. And I think it's important for the board, even though you might not have had an opportunity as a board to hear those details prior, that's our opportunity for you to hear the details ahead of your January meeting. I, I think it would be unfortunate for the board to hear in the January meeting where you have to, where you have to approve a number. That's really ultimately all you're approving in January is what's the number we're going to put on the ballot and let's approve the ballot and let's approve the warning. Um, but I don't want you to, in the same meeting, say, so here's the number I propose, and here's all the impact. What do you think? Make your decision now. I, I think it's important for you to have some time to digest ahead of that decision, which is why I would advocate for sort of giving me the latitude to share whatever information we have ready to go on January 22nd or whatever date it is that this lands on ahead of your January 28th meeting where you have to make that decision. So if you could sort of follow that bouncing ball, the answer is that's the opportunity to hear more. Any other questions? We're going to dig, we're definitely going to be digging deeper. So this is a slide you've seen before with some different numbers. So this, so now I'm going to play out two scenarios for you. One scenario assumes, and this is what you saw in that earlier slide with those December figures in red. This scenario assumes that we use the entire $750,000 to 750 and... 7504, 7505049. Right. <coughs> this is $500 off. I thought for our conversation purposes, 750K was a, a good round number. If we use the full 750K of the fund balance and apply that to next year's budget to offset taxes, so that gets applied as a revenue, and if you remember, we have expenses minus revenue gives us ed spending, and ed spending divided by our equalized pupil gives us the cost for equalized pupil, and it kind of all flows from there down to the tax rate. If we use the entire 750K, so that's sort of our best case scenario right now with the numbers we have in terms of uh, financial impact on, on uh, our community, that reflects a 2.8% increase in the cost for equalized pupil which is a 1.78% on the ed spending and a 1.06% increase in expenses. So those are three sort of different ways you can look at the sort of impact on spending using the full 750. And here's how that plays out from a tax rate perspective. That's not super exciting. This is really the money shot right here. Change per 100,000 of assessed value. We're using all of it, we project Remember, this is a projection, a decrease in the education portion of property taxes of about $10. Uh, do you have slides that shows if we use half of the fund or if you use? <laughs> How about if we use 500000 okay. instead of 750000 which is what I would propose based on what we know right now. And again, that was my next question. Figures could change which may change what I would propose to you, we do with the fund balance, right? If we get some surprise $300,000 cost, I might feel differently about how we use that 750. Given what we know today, right now, I'm thinking it, it would be prudent to reduce that carry forward 
to 500,000. And I'll explain why, and then we can talk about the impact that you see here. If, let's say next year, we're sitting here and we were unable to sustain $750,000 in carry forward from the, this year's budget that we're in. That has the effect of a drop in revenue, which has a negative impact on our education spending, which has an impact of driving up our cost per equalized pupil. We can feasibly absorb the $250,000 drop in revenue as we're building next year's budget, and we would do so intentionally rather than it being forced on us, right? We have the choice now of carrying forward less than 750 uh, because we got some decent financial news around equalized pupil. We may not be in a, in a similar position next year in terms of our equalized pupil projections <coughs> um, and could still be in a position where we're forced to absorb a reduction in revenue because we didn't have a fund balance from this year as great as the fund balance that we had from last year. So the ideal for a, a fund balance carry forward is a dollar amount that you feel pretty confident in uh, and being able to sustain going forward. We were, and to put this into perspective, last year at this time, we made a decision to put $600,000 into a, a capital reserve fund. Mm -hmm. Had we not done that, and we applied a full $1.5 million of that, of that surplus to this year's budget. And, and we only now have $750,000 from last year's budget to use. We would have effectively, effectively decreased our revenue by $750,000. And you can imagine the impact that has. Again, thankfully we've got some good news this year, so who knows. Had it been bad news this year, and we had the seven hundred fifty k hit, we could be in a really tricky spot. So 500,000 seems like a pretty good number for me to sustain. I, I don't know that I would necessarily in the future propose to go below that unless we found ourselves in a really great position. Um, that's one and a half percent, more or less, of our expenses. That feels like a reasonable thing to sort of be able to maintain. And if, if we had a, a catastrophic year and we didn't have any fund balance, it's 500K, not 750K, not 1.5 million, not what it could be. In addition, going forward, if 500K is what we want to try to keep year over year, any fund balance we have above and beyond 500K can just be sort of automatically, not automatically because there's a process to it, but we can just decide that goes into a capital reserve fund. There will always be capital needs. Um, so that's a good way to, to not pay interest on money that we need to borrow to take care of capital improvements and actually generate interest from money that's sitting in a bank account. So there's a swing there um, and it puts us in a position to get work done more, uh, more quickly, which means we're paying at sort of today's dollars instead of tomorrow's dollars, which also saves money. So in many ways, uh, from a sort of financial responsibility perspective, it makes sense to do that. In this particular situation, it does have a $250,000 hit on our revenue. So it does mean that our cost per equalized pupil goes up. So you can see the, uh, my clicker doesn't really work when it hits the screen, but the expenses <coughs> are exactly the same in this scenario and the other. The revenue changes by that $250,000, give or take, um, which changes the ad spending, changes the cost per equalized pupil, et cetera. So that's the impact. But we had, extended conversation last year on this and it was it was the 500k number that was the recommendation to utilize on a year over year basis am i remembering that right um perhaps i don't i don't recall that conversation specifically but i don't doubt that the ideal was was 500,000 um, i think well we have part of the conversation we had 1.5 and carried over 9 right I mean, I'm sorry, what was that? So we had 1.5 and carried over 9, right? Correct. You put the other 6 in the account. Yep. So already the, so we know we can't carry over 9 because we only have 750. So we're already seeing $150,000 sort of reduction in revenue as a result of that. That's built into all the numbers you've seen everywhere. This scenario that you see here, in addition to that 150 that brought us from 9 to 750, would bring that down to 500. I guess I'm looking at... Um, we don't have many years as a complete district to go on. 
to in terms of carryover. The one we started out with was like two, but that was because of some extraordinary combination circumstances. And then we went to 1.5, and now we're looking at 7, 750. So even without doing anything with any of the money, the fund balance carryovers are dropping. True. So banking some of what you do have today certainly seems like it makes sense. Yeah. Regardless. And frankly, they have been dropping. That's real, and they should have been because we were carrying forward too much, way too much. Yeah. And frankly, um, we had too much left over year over year, and the the practice of applying all of it to offset taxes was also problematic. So it's sort of doubly problematic in what the practices had been. And we're in much better shape now than we were, and we have an opportunity perhaps to get in maybe a little bit better shape. So I, I don't recall specifically that five hundred thousand was the the conversation for the target. That makes sense to me. I may have been the one that proposed it. It still makes sense to me if I was. <laughs> you remember a lot of discussion when we set aside that capital fund last year about some healthy number to carry over. And yes. It seems so that we yeah. That yeah, I think I think it probably was. Only we recognized <coughs> to take a million dollars out in one hit was too big a hit at one time. And so we we took six hundred instead. So where does that two fifty that's not here go? Is that going into the reserve fund, or is that right? Reserve? So that would be the proposal. Be is the two fifty that we wouldn't okay. be applying to offset taxes would be added to the six hundred that we put in last year. So that then gives us eight fifty in that capital reserve fund mm -hmm. to add to some money that we are intentionally not spending this current year to then add all of that to our money for from our operating budget next year to tackle the Lockwood budget. Uh, right, so if we have 850000 in the capital reserve fund, we could spend another couple hundred thousand out of our current year operational budget and then most of the million dollars next year in the operational budget, assuming that million gets to stay, which right now it is, all of that together saves up what we need to tackle the locker room project. Mm -hmm. So then that 250000 would go on the ballot as asking sort of... Yeah, so there, uh, it would be... Yeah, I've seen it done different ways. We'd have to look at the language of the article to see if it has to be by ballot or by floor vote at the annual meeting. But yes, it would take a, a, an act of the electorate, one way or the other, to put that money into the reserve fund. And I believe, I'd have to double check, but an act of the electorate to take money out of that reserve fund. Yes, that's what I understand. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which we could start, tar start talking about at whatever opportunity <coughs> we have that mm -hmm. the locker rooms might be coming up and explaining that. And that's something maybe Floyd to put on your radar that we need to we need to be thinking about the timing of when to ask the electorate to take the money out of that account. Just as we think about the the construction project and the what the payment schedule might be and when we would need to access that money to make our payments and make all those commitments. And then I guess hope they say yes, because if they don't, let's say eight hundred fifty thousand dollars maybe that we did we thought we'd have that we don't. That's risky. Sarah? Um, you, and what is your reasoning for not going to like 375 or just like cutting the 750 in half and putting half of it in? Um, it mostly it's, it's really a matter of what, what do we think uh, passes muster with the electorate, right? So right now what people will see on the ballot is $31,279,000, okay. which is a 3.75% increase for equalized people. If we, if we took that full 750 and put it in the reserve fund, that would put us just over the spending threshold, so there'd be a penalty, mm -hmm. and the expense would go, based, more or less, every quarter million dollars that we lose in revenue in this scenario is a 1% increase in the cost for equalized people. Okay. So if we took another 500K out of our revenue, which we could do with the fund balance that we still have in this scenario, that bumps that 3.75 to almost 5.75, okay. which then starts to get questionable in terms of what the reaction of the voters would be with the 5.75 figure. Okay. Okay. So when we pull money, we have to get the electric to the electric to vote on pulling money out of uh, the special the reserve capital reserve fund. capital reserve fund. 
When we pull that out, does that become more linear and then count against the count against uh, equalized people? No, I don't think it becomes revenue. It's okay. just we're just able to spend the money. It's a special category. We can double check on that too. But I don't think that. Yeah. No, I don't think that counts against us. I think that's the that's the intent of the structure of those capital reserve funds is to be able to put them there and um, basically it's money. The capital reserve fund is money that has already been accounted for through taxes and or revenue or whatever it happens to be. So it's it's what's left over in a year. Um, Ready or to right. Yeah. So it's, it's already been accounted for for cost pre equalized pupil purposes, etc. Kind of. What was the difference between our spending spending per equalized people in this scenario versus the last one? So this is at six seventy two. Are you looking at a percentage or a dollar? So dollar. So this is six seventy two more than last year. Okay. And that's five hundred. So one hundred seventy two dollars oh, okay. more per that's student, give or take. Yeah. Um, and so tax rate. So this is also something that people are are interested in, right? So prior scenario using the full seven fifty to offset taxes. Decrease taxes by about ten dollars, using five hundred, increases by about five dollars. Projected, 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 projected. <laughs> Krista, can you just remind me what, what our per pupil increase was last year? Sure. So last year per pupil increased by thirteen hundred fifty percent. A oh, percent increase last yeah, year was like eight point seven one or something like that. Oh. Yeah, it was big. It was big. Your prior was 1%. Okay. <clears throat> so we're nestled right in between the two. But it is. I mean, that's the, honestly, the big driving factor here. No matter what, the total expenses is going to be a big number, and that's going to have some sort of sticker shock for people, and they're going to react however they're going to react. I would say probably the most important figure is the cost per equalized people. And we saw uh, at the last meeting, the direct, the, the direct impact on the tax rate that the cost of equalized people has in the way the formula works. So it's 3.75 or 2.8. <coughs> or some variation, you know, as, as Sarah mentioned, these are just sort of picked as, as benchmarks um, for good reason, but it, it doesn't have to be either 750 or 500, it could be something in between. But you said the 750 puts us over the threshold. If we use the full 750 uh, right now, given the numbers that we have, we fear that would put us just barely over, but over the spending threshold. And that has additional. And then there's a tax penalty on top of that that we have to account for. So um, <coughs> in either of these scenarios, whether we're moving money into the capital reserve or not, um, you have a certain number of folks you need to reduce to meet the goal, yep. aside from attrition, after taking attrition into account, <clears throat> um, or not? Still to be determined. So I would say, I don't know that we would have to make a reduction in force, so riff somebody that, that in, in addition to the, the folks that are taking their career change. I think to hit the actual number target, we could likely hit that sticking to the people that have um, accepted the career change incentive. Okay, that's important for me yep. because otherwise the 250 could be spent in other ways. Right. So in either of these scenarios, it's potential that we wouldn't have we wouldn't have to riff someone to hit a budget target. There may be. This is where some of the conversation needs to continue. There may be. Other reasons, looking at programmatic sustainability, etc. Right. Just from a straight at. dollars, right? But from a straight dollars, uh, it doesn't seem at this point that it would be necessary to make reductions beyond taking advantage of the attrition. Especially if we consider also trying to take advantage of any attrition that might follow the budget process, like outside of career right. change. Sure. Which you acted on one tonight that was outside of the career change. Mm -hmm. So that that's another form of attrition that we didn't have to pay money to get that we could still look to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. And those kinds of things, for sure, are not over yet. <clears throat> Krista? Uh, this might be for our next time, but uh, 
besides just looking at the numbers where it's easy to see what makes sense, 750 or five, or it's easier or more clear. <coughs> um, and program is sort of a big word, but when can we talk about what like projected class sizes might be or what, like our current staff as it is, yeah. are, is that sustainable? Because that might impact what we think we should do, you know, how much we should fund next year, sure. considering our needs right now. Like, so how well are we meeting our needs right now? Um, and would that consideration be something to, would that be a consideration for 750 versus 500 for a sure. sure. Um I don't anticipate that needing to be a consideration in terms of the 750 or the 500 because if, if I think about it from the perspective of in either of these scenarios um, and in any scenario that goes forward, I don't see us um, operating outside of the guidelines, right. the class size guidelines. But that's still uh, the averages, but it would be great to know like what does it look like um, in each school, are we seeing any bubbles? How are we going to deal with those bubbles? Mm -hmm. What will those? What will that take? And are we comfortable with what that will look like, or would we want to provide more support if there's mm -hmm. a need? Um, so that's something that I would be interested in sure. knowing more about. So we um, could we could next time look at. Um, so part of the work that happens between now and then is if there are. Uh, changes that would impact class size. We could look at what those class sizes are um, throughout the district. Mm -hmm. And there are challenges with that, right? So if we're looking school by school, class by class, at what the class sizes are, mm -hmm. it opens up conversations for what schools do or don't have, and is it fair compared to what other schools have? It mm -hmm. can take us down a, a dark path, potentially, so we'd want to think about how do we how do we not go there? How do we not lead people down there? Um, and when you class size at the secondary level, gets it's a much different conversation at the secondary level mm -hmm. than it is at the elementary level. So we have to sort of account for that understanding as well. What's the dark path part? Like, I guess I don't understand that part. Um, for me, the dark path part is comparing schools to schools and um, and people perceiving whether or not their school's getting what it ought to get um, when there's so much more uh, to unpack in, in any of these stories that could be told mm -hmm. than we'll be able to do in, in, a, in a board meeting. Like for instance, like the size of the 5-6 class here compared to the 5-6 class at Bristol. Mm -hmm. That seeming, seemingly these students are getting a lot more, you know, the ratios are smaller. Mm -hmm and all the inferences that one could make that may or may not be accurate and the conversation that would be needed to talk through what that all means. And, um, so, for example, Katrina and I together today had a conversation with a building principal that was over an hour about this top, this conversation at one building. That gives you a sense of sort of the depth of conversation and understanding behind um, configurations, class sizes, the dynamics of the different groups of kids and and everything that goes into that, yeah, um, which we couldn't obviously go into that depth in public session A, mm -hmm. um, and to help everyone get to that same level of understanding. I wonder if there's a way to talk contextually because I think as a board member, it would be it would be good for me to know. Um, do I want to support? more use of a fund balance to ensure that um, that there is that flexibility in our budget or in our staff that 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 we can get people what they need without um, filling gaps in a way that maybe pulls from one place that might also I, I don't know just mm -hmm. um, I might advocate for shoring things up more if I had a better sense of mm -hmm. how um, Not, not, not to drag this conversation out, but there's all, also the other side where looking at static staffing of personnel, or no, wait a minute, you're looking at stat static staffing of students at each building and fluctuating the personnel, there is also the option to 
um, make the students flexible through some some sort of choice or re relocation to satisfy that same issue of balance in the classroom that should be thought about as well. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I, I, I don't know we to no. start another conversation, but there's there's more options than just just staffing yep. to, to take care of an issue. And I think for me what's and this kind of I think it, it kind of speaks to both points a little bit, but I'm thinking more about your, what you're thinking of, Krista. I guess I would be concerned if we got to a conversation or you got to a conversation as a board where it was, we want to actually put two hundred fifty thousand of revenue back in so that you can add teachers to this school to do this thing that is a means thing. That gets pretty pretty quickly to a place of the board directing me around means right. for the ends that I'm held responsible for according to policy. So I'm. I'm I'm interested in hearing thoughts and things like that. Like that's fine for me, but I think that can get tricky, mm -hmm. and would be in violation of policy governance. Okay. And then right. part of another policy that I'm held to is to make sure that the board's following policy governance, <laughs> which is a curious place to be in. Where's <laughs> <laughs> sir? Krista, did you have? There's a quick piece. I think I mentioned this at some meeting somewhere recently, but in Burlington, when people enter the school district, if the fifth grade at the school they live near is particularly full, they say you can't go to that school, you have to go to either this school or this school where we have room in the fifth grades. So that's what Burlington <coughs> does. I know a family where they had room in that school for the kindergarten student and the fifth grade student <coughs> they didn't, so the family elected to go to the other school because they would both be at the same school and then, I mean everyone in Burlington takes the bus, any, the city bus so it's right. easier, but anyway. just. Just, yeah, there's a lot of ways to make a puzzle, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Right. I think, in general, for tonight's discussion, I was just interested in knowing the big picture in terms of whether there was some alternate, you know, if we're publicly telling folks we're going to, we need to make riffs, but we're going to put $215,000 in the capital reserve fund. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a different conversation. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And I think that, and I, I feel confident given what we know now, and I try to, I try to stress that. I don't know if you're picking up on that, but <coughs> things can change. So I, I, I'm not, I can't be held to these numbers, but given what we know right now, I'm pretty confident that we won't be forced to make risks to hit the budget target. And I also don't want to say that that means for sure, I promise you right now, there won't be risks. There may be other reasons um, that make sense to make reductions. Um, and it would have a financial benefit, but the drive wouldn't be because we have to meet a budget target. And so we'll have time in January to mm -hmm. hear that and then make a clear decision about whether we support how much, going which way. Yeah. Yeah. Please. I would also, um, there was this big bold page in our packet, the savings revenue needed to meet or be sustainably under 10% of the spending limit. So this is still us choosing to stay right at under the threshold. Like this isn't, um, I wouldn't say a particularly, I mean this is, a, a, you know, pretty much as generous as we can reasonably get with the budget. So. Uh, and part of this, and I think this is staying high enough level, part of this is, as you're saying, anything we can do this year that is a financial benefit um, helps us in the next budget and the budget after that, right? So, so it has a, a lasting impact. Um, and part of where this gets complicated is we think about trying to take advantage of attrition. Depending on what that attrition looks like, um, if there's if there's someone who chooses to to take the career change in one building, um, maybe maybe there are multiple buildings that are in a similar position to be able to withstand a reduction in force. And in one building where there happens to be a person who took the career change, that building then experiences that reduction. Um, there's potentially an inequity, given that there are other schools in a very similar position that didn't happen to have somebody that takes a career change. And so is it right to not make those changes in those other schools, even though they could? It's simply because they didn't have someone take the career change? I don't know. That, you know that's, a, that's a question that could be answered in different ways with good reasoning. Those are part of the things that we're going to need to continue to investigate and understand more about and make decisions that make sense financially and from an equity perspective as we're trying to sort of build the system. So that's why I don't want to rule out 
Um, sure, but I would imagine you would run into some <coughs> staffing per people issues at some point, trying to even balance that discussion out. I'm not entirely sure that's true. Mm -hmm. And those are certainly things we'd be looking at, um, but There's declining enrollment is real. That's the capacity. And also recognizing we're coming <coughs> off of a year where perhaps we could have sustained reductions, but we intentionally didn't make reductions because of so many reductions the year before. Um, so we have a year of, of static staffing levels, with the exception of taking advantage of some folks that, that chose to leave and we didn't fill. So that's real. Um, and, that, and we still had declining enrollment. So that positions us to be able to withstand um, some change. I think those are all my slides. Yeah. So you mentioned the, the handout. Is that? Yeah. <coughs> so. I'd love to distribute these, have you take a quick glance at these um, and see if there are additional recommendations. <laughs> so this first page that's coming around is the, is the summary page. What you saw earlier had two different pages. You had a, a budget summary in comparison and you had a revenue uh, summary in comparison. So this is now on the same page. And the next thing that's coming around is the detail portion that you saw last time, uh, with us trying to account for some of the formatting changes that were recommended. So if we can get some feedback on this, we can redraft it and bring it back to you um, again. So I'll give those just a minute to get around, and I'll just kind of walk you through what you see for change. <coughs> Yeah, the first one coming around is just one. And Bill and Hannah, this is the, the board sees this stuff regularly and still, still has a lot of questions. <laughs> so chime in at any point, ask away. Okay. So the first page that was coming around, uh, as I said, was a combination of the budget summary in comparison and the revenue summary in comparison. And the recommendation last time was to try and color coordinate. So we've done that on the expense side for the budgets and things. So there's a lot of lines there, so it's hard to get colors that vary dramatically, but they do each have a, a distinct color. And if you look at the, the detail pages, the sections are, uh, the colors correspond to each section there, so it's a little easier to track. And we can continue to play around with colors that maybe uh, are a little easier to differentiate on here. But that was some effort to try and do that. Also, the orientation is different now, being landscape instead of portrait, to put the, um, to put those comments on the right-hand side um, of each line, this footnote, yeah. And then we still have the narrative piece, the sort of that little the sort of blurb at the top of each section that tries to describe a bit about what's in here. This is awesome. And the, the numbers do tie back. Um, this is the, so we had to pick one of these different um, options that you saw tonight to put in here for you to see. So this is the assumption of using 500,000 in the, the reserve fund and not the 750. So it ties back that way. Um, I missed that last thing. So the two lines at the bottom, one right, is 750, so, one's. So if you if you look at the um, <clears throat> at the budget summary and comparison, so that color the colored portion at the top of the the summary page. Yeah. You can see the total proposed budget for FY21 is $31,279,248.21. Yep. Yep. That ties to this slideshow presentation um, where we were looking at the 500, if we use 500K. So 31 million, 279, rounded up to 248. Yep. Um, or rounded down, I should say, to 248. And so you see the difference in, in dollars 
there from last year's budget to or this year's budget to propose next year's budget is three hundred twenty nine thousand and thirteen cents. So that ties to the change um, that you're seeing on the same slide, which is a one point oh six percent increase in the spending. So back in the day, budgets were built on expense over expense. Right. A one percent increase in expenses generally would have been celebrated. Yeah. Times have changed. Well, this so, will certainly be celebrated more than uh, <coughs> six, what it was last year? Yes, 8.17. <coughs> and again, important to remember that even the actual cost per equalized pupil changed because after the budget was adopted, the equalized pupil number shifted a little bit. So it ended up, I don't think it actually ended up at 8.17, even though that's what was on the ballot. And that could certainly happen again this year. So thoughts on the sort of formatting. Uh, obviously, this is a, a hard copy. I don't think we've gone to the step yet where we were talking about hyperlinks from the summary page to the other sections. We can certainly work on that. It's a little time consuming. We didn't get, get a chance to do that yet, but it's, it's a simple logistical thing. It's not hard to do. But assuming that happens, um, I'll accept any other thoughts. And maybe rather than expect that you give them to me here and now tonight, Feel free to digest this, and as a thought comes to mind, just shoot me an email, um, and we can take that into, into consideration as we think about bringing this um, back to you another time. Was so, it? Oh, sorry. So for those of you that were at the um, annual meeting last year and people were um, mm. not digging the presentation, mm -hmm. um, does this seem more what people were asking for? I didn't go to that. Or yes. 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 Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great, thank you. It's uh, really nice. It looks very clean and just. It's very nice. Just curious if there. Um, yeah, yeah. If it's prob if it's problematic to put any kind of a uh, um, an explanation of what these numbers are on the end, even if it's just a footnote, like over on the side, like make a little example. Not like you have to put it at the head of every single column or anything. Yep. This is a code. This is a code. This is, <laughs> this is a subcode. Yeah. And honestly, it, I, I, yeah, I wonder the value of the codes. Or maybe right. just, just yeah, leave sure. them out. Just say this is a code. If it's just yeah. such a question. Yeah. Now, if you're yeah. if you're going to give people the ability to drill way down into something much bigger, that's going to have codes. Then maybe that would be, have, still be helpful to retain. But. And, and that thought is, uh, has been in our. We haven't moved away from that yeah. because there was some. Uh, we have, however, many people that want to look <clears throat> at all seventeen hundred and eighty-one lines, yeah. and that's okay. Sure. And having um, having those codes on the front help them to go find it a little bit easier in that in that deeper dig. Right. Um, but it might be. It, it just might be too confusing as it stands now. I, I, I like it, but I'm, I'm, I'm swimming in the 1,700 lines. Yeah, well, I'm, just, I'm just saying that it, for the uninitiated, it might be helpful to have at least some understanding of what that header. is. Right. Easy otherwise, Maybe that easy. could be a footnote. That's, That's what the I mean. Of the whole document. It could just be a little text box over to the side that just says, here's what these things mean. Yep. Somebody could just say, hey, you've got 650 yeah. pieces of software. I think might be a quantity or something. Function code, right. object code, and then a, a description of what those are. Yeah. And the reality is there are probably, what are there, probably another 16 digits right. of these codes that aren't here. Right. This is the function and the object portion of a code that is quite long. <laughs> I just feel like we need them in order to have, in order for people to reference, they just so often say, 2410, and then you look at that. Yeah. Just yeah. A conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, especially when you have the same term that might occur under several different categories. Right. So. Yeah. 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 Right. Are you loving it, Bella? <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite part? <laughs> So 
with that, I'm happy to just, if there's something else now or as thoughts come to you, shoot me an email. That works too. Okay. This isn't exactly budget, and I'm trying to channel Caleb, who's so good about being like, I don't want to tell you how to do your job, but if I'm being free, I just noticed like sometimes in annual reports, people have, like districts will show like we, like a picture, like we remodeled the gym, we did the locker room, and like, so it's not exactly budget, but I feel like taxpayers can like look at that and be like, oh, like look where my money went. So <laughs> I don't know, I'm trying to even think back of like where they exactly in use that but I just wonder if maybe we highlight kind of these like we did really cool stuff this year with like the pool and the locker room and I don't know if maybe we can yeah. it's not necessarily obviously like in the budget but maybe when they're looking through the annual report they're like yes like this is good we did good stuff with our money yeah, yeah. so thinking facilities specifically yeah that's, I mean that's and the I easiest sort of tangible thing for yeah, the yes, see yeah. it. and I, I mean I brought up other stuff before too of like you know whatever kids do that's like really cool like mm -hmm. just like highlighting how awesome our kids are but that's something I think people can look at and be like yes my money went to something really good, you know mm -hmm. or yeah. also um, yeah. you know I think this is great for the people who want to just see the hard numbers mm -hmm. and have maybe a brief explanation of some of the larger percentage changes um, I think last time we might have chatted a little bit about uh, kind of a budget focused narrative where with the with the uh, flexibility that we did have in the budget whatever that might be might not be a lot we or it's entirely flexible oh, well mm -hmm. I mean a lot of this better, is, what are the decisions a lot of this is driven by things we can't really control but mm -hmm. for the things we could control what were, what was the emphasis on moving money one way or the other in the budget and I think I mean there was that little chart you had trying to connect right. community values you know and that sort of thing yeah. I don't know if there's a maybe a, you can condense that discussion into a you know a mere paragraph or two mm -hmm. it just says our focus was, was the discretionary spending we had was to do X you know, last year I think you could say, well, we were trying to, maintain, you know, retain our staff. Yeah. You know, and we were trying not to. Yeah. I'd be hard pressed to probably ever use the term discretionary money. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. I don't feel like that's. I don't know. It's either all discretionary or none of it's discretionary. I feel like it's sort of the place we find ourselves in terms. So, for example, we can control the number of people we employ. So to say that it's out of our control. I'm not sure it's entirely accurate. It has implications in terms of decisions and how we exercise that control. But, yeah, but but I think your point of uh, a brief narrative that explains some of the some of the things we're trying to achieve uh, programmatically, systematically um, in this budget, connecting it to the values, strategic plan goals, etc. Right. I mean, especially in compared to last year. You know, not not so much like a complete description of everything the school system is trying to do. Um, and we have other documents that do that, but with the difference in the spending that we were able to achieve from last year to this year, right? You know, <laughs> what decisions do we decide to make with that change? Right. Even if it is sort of uh, so, what comes to mind as you're saying that as an example, you know, so much of what we're doing this year is trying to maintain what we put in place last year so there's not necessarily a big change there but to right. be able to say trying to sustain the systems etc and to say put emphasis on security I mean we invested mm -hmm. half a million dollars in mm -hmm. security upgrades for our facilities this year yeah. mm -hmm. that's something to speak to that we could have some yeah, pictures of something. well and even the 250 this is that's fairly discretionary to move the 250 in mm -hmm. the capital fund you know trying to grow the capital fund while we still have funds you know that we can Sustain as a carryover balance. Yeah. Yep. And that sort of discussion, you know, just to. I think it would be good to add in addition to that, um, you know, our facilities. You, you look at what we've done in, a, in terms of investment for downtime um, heat control, where it's it's not no longer we need somebody to come in and turn <coughs> stuff off. It can be generated with a computer. We can program the whole year in for for planned days off. Mm -hmm. We can. Turn the heat down the at five thirty five right right after he calls to give us a snow day. We can't we can't reflect that yet because we don't have a 
we don't have a track record of, of savings, but we can certainly celebrate the fact that we're, we're, we're jumping forward to do what we can to control the, the usage. So, so one of the next steps we talked about is whether we could hyperlink these. And is that, so once you have that set up, the initial leg work, then is it fairly easy in future budgets to reload the new data? So once we sort of have this process up and running, it's easy to do each year. Fairly easy, or not easy. I would love to say yes. Okay. I'm afraid the answer might be more complicated. Well, yeah, I mean, I think this is, this is fabulous. It's so much farther ahead from where we were last year in the conversations that came from the community. And then thinking if we can figure out how to do the hyperlinking, I mean, that's the ultimate in transparency, just sort of how it builds goodwill with the community about you can drill down to your heart's content and ask all the questions you want. It's all there for you. The advantage of this structure is we've taken it out of the accounting system and built our own spreadsheet, feeding it from there and then feeding it back to, um, mostly because of knowing next year we've got to set new account codes and we're going to be moving to another new accounting system. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to avoid past issues with not being able to compare the apple to an apple, mm -hmm. which the, the ancillary benefit to all this front end work this year will be next year yeah. we should be able to format very consistently along these lines with some minor adjustments and you mm -hmm. make a note to it, but I think it's yeah. it's um, it's a lot of work, but boy, I think it's worth it. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. And the reality the, to the hyperlink question, it would all be new hyperlinks anyway, because it's linking to something different. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So the, there's going to be a, a duplication of effort to make this happen year over year, and it doesn't mean it's not worth the effort. Right. right. You could certainly leave the hyperlinks from previous years active. Sure. You want to go look at you want to go look at line, yep, 1437, and really look at how much money we spent on periodicals in the Beeman Library. Go ahead. Hmm. You know? Yeah. Krista. Um, just going back to what Steve was saying, I think I think you've done a really nice job in the past on with the letter in the annual report. Um, and I think, and I'm thinking and it captures some of that overall narrative. Sure. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff that I think is so important and for us to always be figuring out how to do and do well. Um, to tell the story, and I really like some of the suggestions that were brought up, and um, just and make it, you know, celebratory as well as letting folks know, you know, some people get really fired up about energy efficiency. Some people really get fired up about safety. Like, what are some key things yeah. that, um, you know? So I just I think that is, and maybe we could see a draft or, you know, get give you input if there's yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I don't mind like sending it, but I don't want to go to the whole board because. Wordsmithing with twelve people. No, just... but more like I was thinking if people uh, had suggestions of hey, there's something you might want to consider throwing in. That might not be helpful at all. But anyway, I'm sure you'll do it. Even if it's broad topics, hey, this is something I remember that happened this right. year that was a, a sort of a big idea. Yeah. yeah, like here's some suggestions and you can choose which ones and how you want to weave them in. Yeah. But um but our you know, PR around this stuff is important. Mm -hmm. yeah. That could be a great board exercise, I think, to talk about what are the highlights from this past yeah. year? Like, what are the big, yeah. the big events that are worth celebrating or acknowledging? Yeah. Just to give you a list of bullets to think about. Mm -hmm. That sort of reflection is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we ever do like an alumni spotlight? Like, could we get like a name to do like it or somebody? Doesn't have to be her, but like maybe a quick sign. I just, I just noticed like a lot of the, a lot of these annual reports do do like a, you know, are this alumni works for like the Pentagon or something? I mean, whatever it is, but you're just like, yay! Oh, and we have some like of those in the end's monitoring report. In the end, yeah. 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 This has nothing to do with that, oh, but it we does. Can talk about it. Well, it's fine. <laughs> I, no, I, I'm gonna say. Are we able to say we heard you last year and we are trying to do a better job and mm -hmm. like yeah, promote our Yeah. I think the more you say we heard you the We better. heard you. Yeah. yeah. So I don't right. know how to put that in there. Like we have we, responded we, we, to we, we, your yeah. requests. Yeah. Um, to be to show I think us that's much, a fine to thing provide an opening letter. <laughs> so yeah. we don't have a lot of time, like we don't have time at another meeting because I have to have the chair letter ready by the ne at the next meeting. I should have already turned it in. Right. 
So, so it if you the, have ideas yeah. about highlights, <coughs> send them to me. I win. Yesterday. <laughs> um, I'm going to try and get it started over Christmas break, but then I get it started, and then when we hit the beginning of January, that's when I just go at it. So if by the end of the year, if you can get me your highlights, and then I'll have something to pull from. What I used to do at Munchkin is I throw it to the vice chair and then we Yeah, that's what I do. Just do it. Just so yeah. that it's easier to do it with one person yeah. than yeah. Then to, right. to go to the whole group. Or but, but but with people giving ideas ahead of time. Right. Right. <coughs> with um this is from a, a little bit so there's also Maybe it's a future agendas planning idea, but we I have we have heard the idea before about uh, participatory budgeting. So that's not something we would fit in this year. But if we were thinking forward to maybe next year's budget, and if maybe uh, it just seemed like it was really powerful for getting buy-in for your community, it was the way that it was presented. that comes to mind for me is the list of things that are important to do exceeds our ability to do them all and so we have to just keep chipping away and sometimes sometimes the squeaky wheel gets the grease mm -hmm. so as things so I'm thinking about the you know the mold issue we had in the locker rooms really highlighted a concern that was a big squeak that needed to be addressed so that's that's sort of the wheel we're focusing on right now um, there are a lot of other things that aren't great and mostly function, so they take a less less of a priority, unfortunately, at this point. But I feel like that's the area of empowerment with the participatory budgeting potential there, if we figured out how to do that. Maybe. All right. We'll keep moving along. No, good. Um, next is an update on negotiations. <laughs> good, good news is nothing's happened, so I don't have anything. We don't have anything to report at this point. We finished our training and we haven't had any meetings, so there's nothing to report until tomorrow night. Until tomorrow yeah. night. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, next is the community engagement update from the committee. Can I just ask a question <laughs> first? Sure. Um, do we have an executive session? We do. Yes. I'm just trying to figure out if people should get picked up soon or wait. <laughs> um, we will have, um, yeah, yeah, you're right. We will have one. So, so yes, I guess, because um, Bella and Hannah won't be able to stay for executive session. So. Right. And yeah. about, and we don't know about how long. Um, that works. I can give Hannah right how much it That would be awesome. Okay. Thanks, Kayla. Does that work for you? Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I apologize for not including the minutes from our last meeting, and we just met last night. I don't know if anybody that was there wants to. <coughs> Can I just do one quick thing about communications, or maybe we can do it after that, just about where are we posting things and what are we posting and things like that. Yeah. Which is separate from that commit that part of the committee. So yeah. Well, I can do that at, at when we're done with, sure. with that piece. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I, th 
I mean, <coughs> I'm taking minutes, so I'm limited <laughs> what, what, typing and whatever. But what I was struck by the how it, mim it, it mimicked what is going on in our community, the emotion and the logic and the back and forth at the meeting last night was mm -hmm. very <coughs> clear. Like, there were moments of emotion and moments of, well, you know, maybe we have to look at this, and then the emotion would come back in. So mm -hmm. that was, I noticed that as I was typing away, mm -hmm. trying to capture stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think that happens when there's not, and I was only a part of the meeting, but when there's not information to look at, mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to generate eventually is information to look at <coughs> and, and ideas. And that's why we're still in this slippery part. That's why I said, is there anyone else who can help us with that piece of it? So. Yeah, our goal was to kind of reflect on what's happened so far and think about if we wanted to do additional outreach before the January meeting and um, get, and also what we want to send out to the community about what's happened thus far. Um, and so we did spend a lot of time kind of talk in that reflection of what's happened and how it's gone so far with some of that, the emotional um, part of the dialogue in the community coming into our meeting and, and, you know, kind of talked about that and then talked about, well, our role is to really figure out how to keep these conversations going outside of this space so that, you know, more people are grappling with this. Um, we also decided not to do any additional outreach right now. Um, just have our meeting at the end of January with what we have so far. Um, and what we have so far is some data that I, that um, is it linked to our minutes that folks can look at. Um, and that's about as far as we got. Mm -hmm. if, you, if, if you guys want to add anything else. Yeah, and Krista had mentioned this at the beginning of the meeting. I was zooming in, so it felt, it was kind of tricky to, yeah. to inter I could hear some people and some people I couldn't. Um, but it definitely feels like very much a beginning again. So we have all of this information. We've accessed a lot of community members. And so now, what are we going to do with that and how are we going to move forward? <coughs> and, and as you were saying, it mimics what's going on in the community. So I also noticed the parallel <coughs> process, too, that even though we have lots of folks who are very engaged in it, there's still some misinformation about mm -hmm. who can close schools and how that functions and mm -hmm. who has that authority. Uh, then the, the rumor about being in closing came up again, mm -hmm. so we sort of squashed that again. So it's sort of there's this parallel process in the room to what's <coughs> happening out in the community. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I noticed the, the desire to problem solve budget challenges, which I mean, we still, it does make us, when we start thinking about, well, what could we do differently or where would we invest? So that was happening as well, so clarity about even the board's role in that would probably be good. Yeah. Okay, keep moving along. Um, update from the legi legislative. Oh, I was oh, oh, I'm sorry. Just right. a bit about yeah. that. So, <laughs> so, so after these meetings, we'll send out some kind of highlights and coming events, um, just again to help. Just. Nothing really was brief, sort of, um, <coughs> and referring people back to the minutes for the bulk of the information, because a lot of it is there. Um, but a lot of people have been saying, I didn't see about that meeting, I didn't, I think it's tricky to go onto the board calendar and look for stuff. Mm -hmm. So I noticed that some boards and some schools have a thing on the front page of their website with just upcoming meetings, boom. And it's sort of a, some kind of a scrolling list in a month and has it. Mm -hmm. So that people can just look at the website, see that. Mm -hmm. So, and some people have written, wow, it's great that you sent out this thing of the meetings all the way till March, and we'll add as we add meetings. Because um, I could just see it there and I didn't have to, you know, it's just easier. So I don't know if there's any way to do that so that people can be more clear in, about when meetings are. Um, like I said, Moncton has something like that on theirs. It's sort of a generic yeah, I th thing. I think all of the schools have that <coughs> widget on their site, that is right? A widget. Thank you. Where there's a, a calendar, but whether it's consistently <coughs> matching the board calendar, I don't know. Patrick, do you know if that's something that um, 
Um, well, we can look into. We can certainly look into it, and I'm, we're, my thoughts are going more toward our new website, which is yeah. close to being ready to, to launch. Oh, wow. than oh, our yeah. 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 So, Thank goodness. And the calendar <laughs> calendar feature <laughs> specifically is much more prominent in yeah. the new design. Oh, great. But we can think about how how to incorporate this idea of mm -hmm. making specifically the meetings more prominent within that as well. So fond of the current Windows 95. Throw back to old <laughs> Unix. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so, are you going out and asking the board members to post? I mean, I could join all the front porch forums and do it. I do it also on the Moncton Facebook page thing. Mm -hmm. I put everything on there, and that seems to get more responses than anything. Quite frankly, it's like 800 people on that or something. I, don't I just was wondering what your process is. Like, um, so yeah, I had <coughs> um, people. Sarah had said, could you please give it to someone in each town to do it because then it gets confusing. Will one of you do it? And so last time I just did that and I don't know if people posted or not. Okay. I mean, no, was, I could shoot. That was good. I mean, that's, I, that's okay. I got it. I could, do it right <laughs> and I, I, mean, I, could, I could join each one, but I really don't need to get all that email. Oh, come on. Quite frankly. <laughs> run I don't have enough email already, so I, I'd like to get daily emails from five towns um, or four more towns. Um, so does that work? Um, and I'll, tr I'll try to, I mean, you know, so I'll, I'll probably One question this I weekend have. or something. Yeah. One question I have was when Jennifer sends out the agenda to us, right at the top of the email, it always says, please post. Now, is that a direction to us to post someplace? No. That's no, so that's the, we have different groups. There's the board group, there's the board all group, which includes various places that are that do need to post those for to meet the open meeting law. So that's that's who that message that's, is okay. to. Yeah. But if we wanted to take, we, we really don't have a way to take that and post it to front porch forum, other than just saying, making up our own, you know. Can you hyper, hyperlink the? I mean, I yes. could try to, yeah. I'm not good at that stuff, I can learn it. So hyperlink it with like something that I would send out. When that comes out, we'll send another reminder of the calendar, which usually comes out, what, five days before the meeting or something, the actual email, I don't know. Usually it's a week before. So, so, usually before, so maybe a week before I could, Set something out and it would have a hyperlink on it because someone will learn how to do that. Probably my 14 year old can teach me, right, Anna? And um, <laughs> thinking he could teach me how to do the hyperlink, probably. I think he could. So um, I'll figure that out. And so maybe when that comes out, I can set another one with just the calendar. And then the highlight one will come out closer to this meeting, hopefully a week within, hopefully the next weekend I can do it. And we can, so. I'm also, we can take a look at what, so we currently pay a fee to send up to four messages per month to Front Porch Forum and it sends to all the towns. I can see if there if there's an option to pay more money to send more messages and we can just sort of funnel more of that through central office because we could then send the Front Porch Forum, put it on Facebook, put it on Instagram, put it on all those various social media outlets and we that don't we're have connected to, to yeah. and then it's not so many people yeah. trying to. Mm -hmm. So there's a way I think we can facilitate this. So it may, if, I don't know for sure that it's even an option to pay more money and get more posts, um, but we can look at it and if, yeah. if there is. Really it turn it down. Oh. I, I don't know, it, it was it actually took a little bit of work to be able to do what we're doing. So, yeah. um, so we'd be thinking of two, the, the highlight one and then the one a week before the meeting, reminding of the meeting with the hyperlink and the rest of the meetings through three months forward or something. Yeah, yeah. We could do the beginning of each month, MAUSD yeah. meetings this month. Because the other piece, as I'm thinking about the website again, um, all of our social <coughs> media are connected automatically to the website, so it's mm -hmm. going to be feeding through the website. So if they're mm -hmm. on the website, they're seeing all of our social media posts. So oh. they're, they're all be connected that way. So if we, we, are we can put this the hard way, if we can put it all in one place, it's just it's easier for board members. It's yeah. easier for the user to yeah. go to wherever you want to go, and you're going to see all the yeah. information. Yeah. Can you call it an announcement? Yeah, an announcement. All right, VSBA update. <laughs> so um, the VSBA strategic plan was reviewed, and they added a, the staff added in a retreat a section about membership and membership engagement, um, and that was approved. So the the strategic plan, which is a working document, and the document that activities are measured against, is is all set. 
Um, regional regional meetings that were approved. There was a proposal to schedule them in the spring instead of the fall, and they were approved on a um, one trial basis. So the regional meetings will be in the spring. Spring meeting, I think, May, April, May, June, which to me is early summer. But um, for this year to see how they go, there's some concerns about attendance at that time of year. Um, the VSBA staff was hopeful that they could spread out all the activity in the fall along with regional meetings and the annual meeting and all that sort of stuff. Um, statewide health care bargaining, everybody knows about that. It was an update. Um, there was, a, at the end of the meeting underneath new business, there was um, a member that called out for some training at the VSBA board level around proficiency-based learning, which ended up being quite a bit of discussion about, about that whole concept, the um, relative um, unpreparedness <coughs> or, or not knowing, particularly from a board level, not so much from an uh, in-the-weeds level of, of the whole concepts and the progress progress of instituting it and, and how how it's being perceived by um, colleges and, and that sort of thing in, in the next level for students. So that, I don't, I don't know if it will become a big issue or not, but it looks like something that there's a desire to discuss amongst the board up there. Um, this is the last sort of organizational meeting, if you will. Next meeting will be um, in January, once the, and the legislature will be in session, so there will be all sorts of gearing up towards that. Sue uh, talked to quite a bit about preparing for a lot of cost activities and initiatives and topics in the legislature this year. And that's it. All right. Thank you. Uh, the next item is an update from the Community Council, and that was included in your packet. And we have our representatives <coughs> here, so if you ever have any questions, I'm sure they could answer them. Well, <laughs> um, so last year was more of our building year, our rebuilding year. Um, this year we've gotten a lot more members, and we've tried to get members from each department. Um, including community members from each town. Um, we welcome anyone to come sit and listen. Uh, we're, we're pretty much a proposal-based like um, council. So uh, someone puts in a proposal to us and we review it for two meetings and then we vote on it. Um, we just had, we, last year we approved two murals, which was to Paint, what was it? It was to. We did. We have two murals that are not in the hallway that we like approved. Yeah, and then um, one of them is a mural of a whale, of a whale that is near the high school science wing. And the other one <coughs> is kind of a like equality love positive mural that is in one of the stairwells. Which was put up by Girl Scouts. Yeah. <coughs> we also had two proposals put, put in of a board games club and a video game club. We recently also just passed a proposal for the chess club, which meets weekly. That's do you have anything else? Okay. Do you guys want to talk a little bit about this, the, the fact that on this agenda for the first time ever, there's an update for community council and how that got there and what that, what the future might look like for that? Um, so we divided into two kind of committees, one for like changing our constitution and one for um, the school board, so like, and we're talking about, um, like, what our role is of community council is at our age and also in other groups in the community that, like, 
make decisions that impact our school. And so that's one of the things that we came up with was having an update in a document to put on here. So. How often do you guys meet? Every Monday. Yeah, every Monday. Every Monday. And board reps on that are Krista and Liz. Mm -hmm. uh, I also attend most of the meetings. Mm -hmm. um, Mount Abe administration is usually represented as well. Mm -hmm. okay. Lots of teachers, several community members. Full group is 23, somewhere around there. Yeah. Be careful, this might get uh, contagious around the rest of the school. <laughs> <coughs> well, thank you. <coughs> All right, so um, we're going to need an executive session. So why don't um, we give a, uh, or we can make the motion, I guess, and go into it and then give a few minutes to the I think we just need Patrick because we are going to be around talking about the superintendent's evaluation. So, um, so um, I'll need an executive session under Title I DSA Chapter 5, 313A for the evaluation of the facility. And we'll invite Patrick to go in at 8.11. So is there somebody willing to make that motion? So moved. Sarah McLean and All those in favor of going into the executive session, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, we'll give them that for everybody. Everybody stand up and stretch. <laughs> and I, I can give you the statement after. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Okay. Oh, so we are out of the executive session at 9 o'clock. So we have a brief statement um, on the superintendent evaluation. Tonight we report that the board has completed the superintendent's annual evaluation. The board is in agreement that Superintendent Reen is making reasonable progress towards the board's ends and improved student outcomes as documented in the ENDS monitoring worksheet. Superintendent Reen's motivation remains focused on the students of MAUSD and their continued improvement. The board supports his continued employment. Okay. There's the motion. Okay, I move to direct board chair to meet with board council to draft contract details and terms for a three-year contract. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Thank you. I'll give you this if you want to. Just this and give us a statement. Give a statement and then give us a motion. Okay. All right. Um, any public comment? Great. <laughs> okay. Meeting evaluation. Question number three. One was the date, and two is my name. Three. What is the level of engagement of all board members? High, low, or comments? I actually, that's my options. Way high. too high. 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 <laughs> what was, was the agenda followed? Yes, no, or comments? Yes. 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 Five. How would you describe the board chair's effectiveness in establishing agendas and selecting materials for distribution to the board? Unsatisfactory, acceptable, good, or very good? Very, very good. good. <coughs> How would you describe the board's the what? That's old language. This is what's in here. Yep. How would you describe chair's effectiveness in fostering a professional culture of the board regarding board climate, full participation of all board members, and ongoing board training? Yes. Very uh, good. Unsatisfactory, acceptable, good, or very good. Other feedback for the chair. I have one, one yes. small thing. Could we, um, if we know we're going to go to an executive session and not have much after, could we move our public comment, our second public comment? Yeah, we can do that. That's no problem. Yeah. Could we move the second And that has been past public. practice. Yeah, I think I the think question is simply a matter of with, we had to with an action item to follow. Right. Yeah. The question is, 
Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Are we going to say something that somebody might want to comment after they hear what our statement was? All right. So I guess maybe who we have two. I'm just thinking that someone might stay for the really meaty stuff, mm -hmm. and then, you know, yep. not want to wait for an hour. Yeah. Yeah. It is awkward with executive sessions if people just take off to wait for an hour. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, number eight. What went well with the meeting? It's ended. <laughs> the makerspace were great okay. downstairs. Yeah, that yeah, was really cool. cool. Uh, we got good news tonight, guys. I think it yeah, was Yeah, we did. Yeah. There's some laughter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't all bad. I danced a little bit. <laughs> what really suggestions do you have did. for ways to improve future meetings? I really appreciated also Hannah and Bella being here. Yes. And Hannah speaking up. That was yeah, yeah. Appreciation of student participation. Uh, and then... Oh, we're here. I have no idea. It's so strange. I don't know where I get that from. <laughs> suggestions from my house. All right. Any improving future meetings? No, we're good. Done? Done. 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 Thank you. Right. Motion okay. to adjourn? <coughs> so move. Second. Third. <laughs> Delay All, right. All those in favor of adjourning at 916, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Oh, my guess is the only reason you wouldn't know where you get it from is because you're not sure if it's a home or dad. Yeah, that's <laughs> my problem. You could pick either one. That's, that is a problem.